Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live. This is our weekly Q&A session. My name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. Many of you know me as your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. You're on Facebook Live right now at Dr. Tofai. You may also be following me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Hernia Doc. At the end of this hour, we will make sure that you have access to my YouTube channel where I will be posting uh, the link to watch all of this and share our hour. This uh, session will have Dr. John Fisher. Dr. Fisher is a plastic surgeon, plastic and reconstructive surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania in Florida. I've known him through the American Hernia Society where we're having more and more plastic surgeons be involved um, and we love it, which I think is great. And John's one of our prominent ones. So welcome and thanks for joining me. Well, thanks so much for inviting me, Sharon. It was uh, it was great to get the invitation and a pleasure to be here. Thanks, John. So I think I think we first met on the board. Are you still on the board of the American Hernia Society? Yep, still on the board. Uh, <laughs> fortunate fortunate to be asked to do a second term, which has been a real privilege and honor, and it's been great collaborating with you. And uh, yeah, plug to the AHS. Um, really, a terrific society that I think uh, does a lot for its members and uh, is really aiming to advance the field. Yeah, I've shared my story with AHS before. We had uh, Chuck Philippi, who was one of the more senior members of the AHS. And the first person I really met at my first meeting at the AHS, and he was so lovely and so kind. I told him that if he wasn't so kind of, he like came up to me and introduced himself to me, which I thought was lovely. And I was straight out of residency, my first job, and uh, I had presented then. Um, uh, it really was a very warm welcome, and that's that really stayed with me. I still remember that. I don't think he remembered it though. Um, and so I've loved being part of the society ever since, and I've seen a lot of fantastic advancements and so much good things that we're doing for surgeons and patients and the advancement of hernias. So it's great that you're on board. Absolutely. And so you're a plastic surgeon. Um, if you can just describe really quickly how that differentiates you from like me, a general surgeon, and like the philosophy by which you're trained versus, especially in relationship to abdominal walls compared to, you know, how we get trained. Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. I think, um, you know, plastic surgeons, I think have a unique way of thinking about surgical problems, whether they're reconstructive or aesthetic in nature. And I think that you know, the, the fundamental principles of plastic surgery relate to restoring form and function. I think yes. that um, you could distill that down and really think about, um, you know, any kind of set of operations, whether it's abdominal wall reconstruction uh, or rejuvenating the face. And we're really trying to maximize um, the way people look and feel and also uh, really restore um, kind of function to whatever part of the body that we're working on just to maximize quality of life. I kind of like to think of my job uh, simply is to, to maximize people's quality of life through surgery. I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. And this whole function, so as many of the people that are watching know, we used to just patch hernias all the time. Like you patch a hole in, a, in the wall. Um, there's no function. There was no function to it in the abdominal wall. And it really wasn't until we got to learn more of the plastic surgery literature with Ramirez and ways to kind of manipulate the abdominal wall to be able to close the hole without it popping open, um, that we started doing the closure of the hole primarily and then using mesh or something to reinforce it as needed. But before we were just see a hole, patch it, and that restored no function, it just prevented intestines from popping out. And I think the plastic surgery influence really helped us bring function back to hernia repairs for the abdominal wall. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think it's a, it's a lovely example of how kind of cross-pollinization of ideas and knowledge, I think, can improve a specialty. And I think for abdominal wall reconstruction, there's just terrific kind of cross-disciplinary collaboration between general and plastic surgeons that have, I think has served to advance the field. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great point. Yeah, and um, so as you know, I, I practice in Beverly Hills. So before I used to practice in a very kind of high volume acute care hospital, big LA County hospital. So 
we dealt with much sicker patients than I do now and also people with like higher risk. And so the goal was to restore them to be able to go back to work and, and be functional. Um, but now in addition, like aesthetics is very important. So I try and use smaller trocar sizes, smaller incisions. I work with plastic surgeons and I learn a lot about what to do. And as an example, I'd like to know your point on this. We're gonna be talking a lot about diastasis recti and so on, but people with hernias have diastasis recti, which is a separation of the muscles without a true hernia. But I feel like either, the, either they're more at risk for having a hernia because of that thinning, or let's say they have a surgery, a gallbladder surgery um, or a prostate operation, and they take out the gallbladder or the prostate through that scar, which is through the thinned diastasis, and now they get a hernia. And I'm a big fan of addressing the diastasis at the same time, if possible. Um, I don't know if you guys like routinely do that. To me, it's like, oh, this is, we should be doing this. But I don't know that most people do that in the general surgery side. Yeah, certainly on the plastic side, I think if, if someone has diastasis and a hernia, I think that you really have to correct the diastasis because there is a pathology there to it. You know, as you pointed out, I think, um, because of the pressure, um, either after pregnancy or in men, because of their anatomy, uh, they can get thinning of that midline kind of fascia or that, that kind of area of, of thickening. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can lead to some significant weakness and functional issues. So I think it's really important to correct it as part of, a, I, I would say, a comprehensive treatment plan for anyone who has a hernia. And I certainly do quite a bit of diastasis repairs as part of my practice. I feel that the diastasis is almost like a, what, what you're doing is you're close, you're plicating or kind of, what's the right term, folding over this normal tissue, over this kind of thinned out tissue. Besides it giving a flatter look, I feel like it takes tension off of the underlying hernia repair or hernia problem. So have you ever thought of using a diastasis plication as like a biologic alternative to mesh for hernias? Yeah, I think that's almost exactly what I do for my diastasis patients is just, you know, a, a application kind of, you know, bringing the rectus muscles into kind of proper alignment to improve function and kind of getting back to healthy tissue. Um, I haven't tried that for my hernia patients. I, I usually just rely on kind of those techniques of releasing um, the abdominal wall to get the midline closed. But right. I think it's an interesting idea because uh, both kind of treatments can probably draw some principles from one another. Um, you know, in terms of kind of how we approach each problem. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's because I've had a handful of women who have had in belly button hernias or incisional hernias. And the size is over that kind of one to two centimeter um, size where we are comfortable not using mesh and doing a tissue repair. So three or four centimeter defects. And, you know, they've also kind of, I said, you, know, you got a lot of extra skin here if you consider the tummy tuck. And many of them choose the tummy tuck. And so I'm in there with a plastic surgeon. So if it were in my hands and it was purely a, a, an incisional hernia pair, four centimeters or, a, or a, like an umbilical hernia, with a three centimeters, I would have used mesh because all the studies support uh, that your, your repair will just fall apart. But then we go in and we're doing a plication with the tummy tuck and I feel like you can close the defect and then plicate over it. And there's, it's so loose, the tissue is so loose. So we've been pushing the envelope up to about four centimeters of not using mesh. And we're following our patients now instead of using the tummy tuck as an alternative type of repair. And you know what? So far, they've all done really well. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and that's really in line with how my clinical practice is and some of the yeah. things that I do. Um, I think when you, when you talk about someone who has a, a hernia in, in kind of a sea of diastasis, you know, yeah. even a, even a three centimeter hernia where you typically use mesh, I think that, you know, as soon as you close that and plug it, you, you no longer have a hernia. And I think that some of those kind of properties that would make you want to put in mesh, I think those, those conditions are kind of gone. And so um, the plication in and of itself, I think is, is a great way to address it. So I've kind of you know, kind of moved away from using mesh in, in most of my diastasis patients. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's define something. So plication, you want to explain what plication means? Yeah, sure. 
So um, if you think about um, the rectus muscles or the abs being separated, it's basically, I kind of talk to my patients who present, and they're usually postpartum women, um, typically patients who've had multiple children. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a separation. I kind of call it almost like an internal corset. And people really get that mm. analogy, like you're kind of lacing up a corset that you're going to wear on the outside to kind of hold everything in. Let's say you're going out or doing something. This is going to be an internal corset using sutures. And I typically... Um, intraoperatively or during surgery, we'll look at the abdominal wall very carefully, figure out kind of where things have to be in order for them to be normalized. And then we basically do multiple layers of sutures, almost like a multi-layer corset. So you get kind of like two corsets um, on top of each other. And that reduces the chance that it re rebulges or, or kind of recurs. And we've had a lot of luck with that. Yeah, that's true. I really like that way so a corset where you'd kind of tighten it, you know, you see how it kind of gathers together. That's exactly what you're doing with the plication. That I, I, I may steal that. You should. I, <laughs> that's I, that, a good people, one. It, people really get that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it kind of is a good analogy. Okay, the other term you used was releasing the abdominal wall. Can you explain what that means? Sure. Uh, so releasing the abdominal wall, kind of what, what kind of um, we kind of say is, is a component separation or a muscle release. We typically do that for, for big hernias where we're trying to get the hole in the abdomen closed. And what we do is we take advantage of our knowledge of the layers of the abdominal wall. And so what we can do is we can release one of the layers very carefully and very precisely in order for us to close the hole in the defect. Um, and yeah. the analogy that I use for this is, you know, typically when I have a patient- no Oh, you know, <laughs> you've yeah. probably done the same thing, but, but I have a patient in the office with a really big hernia and, you know, we talk about weight loss to kind of, you know, re reduce the contents, but we also talk about kind of getting all the packaging back inside. They use a suitcase analogy, like it's an overpacked suitcase, trying to get all the clothes in. And if you have one of those, you know, fancy suitcases that has a, a, an unzippering button that kind of expands yeah. it. I use the analogy that a component separation basically does that. It kind of expands your suitcase so we can get all the clothes in and kind of zip you back up. And so the zipper doesn't break from too much tension. And that's kind of what I tell patients is that we're, we're using a very selective kind of, um, you know, releasing mechanism to expand the volume of your suitcase, basically. Oh, that's a good one because Mo Nahabanian, who we sp spoke to sometime last year, used the suitcase analogy, but it was more about um, the suitcase inside the, uh, the contents inside the suitcase and like intra abdominal fat. And so if you lose the weight, then we can close the suitcase, but you got to like empty it out before we can close the suitcase. But the component separation or like the, what are some terms for that? Restopa or tar, transverse yep. abdominus release, anterior components release. Those are that, that extra zipper that expands the, um, the, the suitcase, I mean, it does make it a little thinner, right? It does. Yeah, area, it does. A little thinner, it, but it, there's it, no it may, it may, Yeah, it may change the shape of it. And I tell patients that, yeah. you know, kind of the, the overall shape of their abdominal wall may be different, but they're uh, less likely to have a hernia. And, and you're exactly right. It's that expandable zipper feature um, that we use because, yeah. you know, we know the uh, abdominal wall anatomy and we can do it very precisely. I like it. And just for everyone watching, almost everything we're discussing today will be about the abdominal wall, which means around the belly button, between like your chest bone down to your pubic bone and kind of to left and right of it. We're not really gonna be talking too much about inguinal hernias unless you have a special interest um, in that. But uh, most of what Dr. Fisher and plastic surgeons do that deal with abdominal wall hernias are kind of like in the mid gut um, abdomen area. The other question is, how would you treat thinning of a muscle of the abdomen or flank that's re that has happened after mesh removal? Have you seen that? Yeah, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, someone who has had mesh removal, you have to assume they've, they've had a mesh repair and they've had surgery and probably, yeah. you know, multiple surgeries. So, you know, some patients can get, you know, thinning of the abdominal wall just from multiple operations, the yeah. scar tissue, weakening, muscle atrophy. Um, and I think that um, if you can get healthy tissue back together, and I think this is, I'm like a really simple, simple plastic surgeon. If you can kind of distill it down to something very simple, if you can get healthy tissue back together in a relative tension-free manner, basically 
not too much stress across it, I think that you're going to derive a really good functional outcome for patients. The other thing that we, we routinely do, and you already alluded to this, uh, Sharin, is that we typically reinforce these hernias with mesh. And I think that mesh has really become a cornerstone, and it's one of the cornerstones that we've adopted in our practices. And for me, the biggest cornerstone, I think, is getting healthy tissue back together. Um, and so that's what I would probably recommend in that particular example is trying to, you know, use my techniques to get that tissue back together. Yeah, I've seen a patient who had mesh removal from the abdominal wall. And it looks like she had like a tram, like that entire rectus is pretty much gone. It, it's not technically gone. There's like a thin layer, but it's completely atrophied and thinned out in, in a segment. And I wonder, you think maybe they had like a nerve injury as part of the mesh removal? Because Mesh removal itself should not take that much tissue away. Or at least those of us that do it for a living, we really try and minimize how much natural tissue we sacrifice as part of the mesh removal process. So it's just really odd to me because that one side is just atrophied. And so now she has this kind of disparate abdominal wall. And um, I'm wondering what you think of, of why it happened and also now that that's happened, how do you help reconstruct an abdominal wall where you're missing functional muscle on one side? Yeah, that's, that's a really tricky situation. And um, I, would, I would probably venture to guess, as you suggested, there was probably some type of nerve damage or nerve injury. Yeah. Um, the rectus muscles are abs. They're, they're innervated by very small nerves. And if those nerves get damaged, some or a few of them, you can, you can really see some you know, changes in the rectus muscle. You can see bulging. Um, on the CAT scan, as you said, things can really thin out. Um, it's a tricky problem. I think that having a really frank conversation with the patient is probably the most important thing to do is that there's going to probably be some long-term functional issues. Um, you know, my approach to those types of patients, uh, which we often see, as you mentioned, women who've had tissue move from their abdomen to reconstruct their breast mount, they can often get these types of bulges, basically yeah. weakening of the abdominal wall. I tend to adopt um, kind of a placation type approach for these patients trying to get the rectus complex um, really as tight as possible, recognizing that there's going to be some inherent weakness and, and then reinforcing the whole abdominal wall with a large piece of mesh and, and had some great results. So basically placating and using a large piece of mesh to kind of suspend the abdominal wall. And, and we've seen some, some positive results with patients. Do you do that for all your breast flaps or just the, the trams, like for a deep so, mesh? Yeah, not, not always for a deep flap, you know, it really depends on the quality of the fascia. Um, but I think for a tram, we typically will put in mesh for the women who get a bulge after the operation where right. they have really thinning of the muscles. I really think you got to treat it like a hernia. Um, it's kind of in that, in that bucket of really severe diastasis, you yeah. know, bulge and kind of hernia and you kind of have to apply hernia principles, I think. Yeah. Okay. We have a, we have a complicated question for you, but um, it's something I was alluding to uh, a bit earlier. So this, this lady, she has a very wide diastasis rectum, it's 16 centimeters, no hernias. And she's explaining that, so she's had three babies. She's explaining that she feels like her, everything is wide open all the way up to her sternum. So what advice do you give her for repair to number one, regain function, number two, help her pain because she's really unable to do much bending, lifting, or even play for a long time with her children. And once she is repaired, is she able to go back to her more athletic lifestyle, um, coaching volleyball, teaching dance, and so on? So these are extremely wide diastasis recti. What are your thoughts about approaches for that? So first, this is a really severe diastasis. Um, and I think that, um, you know, a return to normalcy, I think could be achieved if you get a, a good repair. Um, mm -hmm. I think a good repair would definitely help with pain and function. Um, I think um, the approach that I would consider for this might be to treat this like a real hernia. Um, when you talk about a 16 centimeter diastasis, you, you know, even though you don't have a true hernia, which means there's a hole in the tissue, you just have a severe, and in this case, very large weakening. Yeah. I think, you know, you may want to treat this like a hernia um, and, uh, you know, kind of take the abdominal wall apart, put it back together and add mesh. Um, I really, when the, when the diastasis is above 10 or 12 centimeters, 
um, kind of, I, I move away from my kind of um, core setting with suture and start thinking carefully about adding a piece of mesh to kind of support the abdominal wall because there's gonna be a lot of tension across the, the corset if you just use sutures yeah. and oftentimes they can, they can fail. So I think in this particular situation, um, you know, it might be worth treating this like a, a big hernia and considering a formal repair with mesh. Um, so I've seen uh, like a Reeves Stopa, a retrorectus mesh placement for some of these, treating it like a hernia, um, or do you plicate and then do onlay mesh? Like how is the so, practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I've done it both ways. Um, you know, um, I think um, uh, for these big ones, and I've treated a few upwards of 20 centimeters, we, wow. you know, we, we've done a retro muscular mesh placement. Yeah. Um, you know, typically um, that will involve a big kind of horizontal bikini cut or a vertical cut, depending upon kind of what the skin looks like. Um, but I think that that's probably the best approach for these really, really big ones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's just not a lot of, information or evidence out there to help guide us. But mm -hmm. I've in my practice found a lot of uh, kind of success in this approach. Um, one of this big is, is to kind of treat it like the hernia. And those principles, I think that we use in hernia repair, I think that they, they do work well in this type of problem. And what are your suggestions to people that are unable to lose their weight because they can't be as active as they wish to be. And yet you need that weight loss to decrease the tension so that you can close the diastasis. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think that that usually tends to be the case uh, for uh, some of the men that I see um, who have what's called intra-abdominal obesity, not, not mm -hmm. typically common in the, the postpartum women I see. But I, I think that the, the first thing is, as you said, is just kind of communicate to the patient kind of the, the benefits and the need to lose the weight. And I think that once you've kind of gotten the same wavelength with your patient, trying to motivate them to do it, and then giving them you know, information about how to go about doing a diet and exercise. We'll oftentimes send patients to a medical weight loss specialist. Um, and then as a last resort, we'll kind of point them in the direction of a bariatric surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are all legitimate because you need help with either medications or guidance uh, with by a physician who specializes in weight loss and then even surgery. We're very um, aggressive in getting patients that help. It's really hard to do it on your own. It'll take you three or four years to get to where you need to go. So to expedite that, um, it really helps to have some physician guidance in that direction. Absolutely. And these sutures that you place are always uh, uh, non-absorbable sutures? I typically actually, believe it or not, I, I kind of believe in uh, fully absorbable sutures. And so I think that the, wow. the, the reason is actually is if, if, if you put, you know, permanent sutures in the diastasis repair, uh, they're never going to go away. And so every time the abdominal wall kind of activates, there's a possibility that it could kind of pull through and, and it's almost counterintuitive. But I, I personally have found that the absorbable sutures actually work better for this. I typically do a multi-layer kind of plication. So uh, that just means that means multiple layers stacked on top of each other, and it seems to work well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that there's there's still maybe some opportunities for for further research in this area about which works best and kind of which situation. That's pretty cool. And so you've you've had good results with absorbable sutures, like slowly absorbing sutures. Yeah, so sutures that kind of go away over a period of three to six months. Um, I think that wow. um, there's some evidence in the plastics literature that. Um, you know, if you do two layers as opposed to one, you really, I think, achieve a greater net strength. And that's kind of what I do. Um, yeah. I do really kind of two good layers of kind of al almost like um, a quill type suture, a barb suture where um, you, you pull it through and it's not going to move and, and it works quite well. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on mesh sutures? Have you, have you ever used those or? Haven't used them uh, personally, but um, I've uh, seen them in person. I think it's a terrific idea and perhaps a great indication for um, you know diastasis, where where we have a problem that really I think um, is a thinning of tissue, and oftentimes sutures you know can can kind of pull through that thinned out tissue. And so I think it's a very innovative concept, and uh, you know hopefully it you know is something that we have in our toolbox to be able to treat these patients someday. Yeah, very good. The next question is more of a philosophical question, which is when you approach uh, someone with a hernia, like how is your thought process different than a general surgeon? Is it like you have a wider understanding of the anatomy or is it like the type of scars you place or it can be different, your, your technique may be different. What, since, since you do work with general surgeons and 
and they hang out with some of us. <laughs> um, how do you compare your kind of evaluation thought process to be different? Well, I think it's it's not too different. I bet you it's it's largely the same as someone who does a lot of hernia uh, to, to myself, frankly. And I think yeah. the things that might be a little bit different um, are uh, related to kind of my my kind of surgical approach. I tend to you know kind of not be a not I'm not afraid of making a bigger incision, you know, to really I think achieve uh, I think a, a better kind of more functional or more aesthetic result because mm -hmm. I'm very comfortable with closing tissue and, and contouring. So I think that that's kind of one thing that you know I have in my toolbox and as part of my training and background is that I'm very comfortable, um, you know, contouring the skin and, and taking apart things and kind of putting right. it back together. And so um, that may differentiate me a little bit, but I think for those of us, you know, general and plastic surgeons alike who um, do a lot of complex hernia, I think that our mindset and kind of our philosophies uh, and kind of our approaches are, I think, pretty, pretty, pretty much the same, um, I think. Are you more or less likely to use alternative meshes, biologic meshes, hybrid, or are you more in this kind of standard mesh use? Yeah, so I think um, I try to individualize it to each patient and talk with each patient. Um, I definitely has, have had a lot of success with uh, biologic and biosynthetic meshes, but um, it's really kind of an individualized decision to kind of talk with the patient. What are they comfortable with? What what kind of amount of support does the abdominal wall need? So I'll give you an example, maybe. So, you know, a 35-year-old comes into the office who has excellent tissue, is going to live for 40 or 50 years, um, you know, on average, um, you know, the, the decision between putting a permanent piece of material into the abdominal wall, if they have healthy tissue and a fixable hernia, I think the, the risk benefit shifts more towards using something that's gonna go away over time mm -hmm. um, because of the conditions. If you have someone, you know, kind of by contrast, you know, 60s or 70s who has a thinned out abdominal wall just from aging or weakness or obesity, yeah. And, and their life expectancy is much shorter. I think that, you know, putting a permanent synthetic in makes a ton of sense. Um, and there's kind of areas of gray in between all that. So I think that it's an individualized and tailored approach, but um, I think that, yeah, um, that's kind of in a nutshell what I think about. Okay, cool. And what kind of biologics do you use or absorbable meshes do you use? Um, I've, so I've used a, a lot of different types of meshes. Um, I've used, um, uh, poly four hydroxybutyrate, which is a phasix mesh. Phasic mesh um, I've used N form mesh, uh, which um, is a faster absorbing um, uh, biosynthetic. Yeah. I've used a various number of different biologic uh, meshes. Um, you know, a lot of them are porcine biologic meshes, so so made from uh, pig tissue and ultimately um, kind of. Uh, manufactured to be able to be used uh, in humans and kind of I use those in really, really high risk complex cases. Um, and then I've used, you know, standard synthetic meshes, whether it's um, polypropylene or PTFE. And do you feel that the biologic meshes, the key is to, I mean, there's a trick to them because you can, you know, when I first started the county, it's a huge burn center. So we had a huge amount of skin available uh synthetic not skin synthetic like cadaver skin so our contract mm -hmm. with life cell which was the main um producer of these cadaver skin cells was great and so i had access to this new product called alloderm um which had just come out and i had like we had it it was like so easy to be accessed so i was using a lot of it in these mesh infected patients and so on and we learned fairly quickly you can't use it like regular mesh you need some type of scaffold for it to kind of grow on. You can't just bridge. So we've changed our techniques since then. And most of us have not used, we t I think we overused the biologic absorbable meshes and now we're kind of tailoring it to appropriate use. But do you agree with that or do you use it as a bridge as well? It's a great question. I, I really try to, so, so when you say bridging, you basically mean that the tissue doesn't get closed, which we had said was the really important thing in, in right. hernia. Right. Um, I think that if I can avoid bridging, I usually always do. And, and it's very, 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 very once in the blue moon rare uh, that I ever bridge anyone just because of how aggressive I am with my releases and my techniques. But mm -hmm. if I have to bridge, I think you're right, uh, Sharina. I typically am using biologic for, for whatever reason, just so complex that that's kind of 
what ultimately gets used. And I think you're absolutely right is, um, you know, mesh does better when it's up against, you know, healthy you know, tissue, it incorporates better, yeah. grows in better and it becomes stronger. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, where I use. It supports the repair. It supports the yeah. repair as opposed to being the repair. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I use a lot of human alloderm in the breast. Um, you know, that's what you refer to alloderm, um, yeah. which is great and been used a lot in, in breast. So I've used that for breast. Yeah. We have a question about abdominal wall release or what we often refer to as component separation. Is there blood vessel and nerve trauma that can increase in complications and infection rates? And what is the risk of either the nerve or blood vessel trauma but, and also the infection rate risk with these operations? Yeah, that's that's a terrific question, and um, I'll, the the short answer is yes. There's 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 a risk, and I think that you know that's got to be part of the conversation with patients. Uh, that risk, in my personal hands, is is pretty low. Um, you know, when you precisely release the intended layer of the abdominal wall, um, it's a pretty um, it's a pretty nice dissection. It, it's basically what we call an anatomic dissection. It basically yeah. means you're separating layers that can be easily separated, and there really shouldn't be you know, bleeding or nerve injury. With respect to kind of the, the risk, I, I think it's important is because, um, you know, the, the benefit of doing one of these releases is that you're more likely to close the tissue, which means you're less likely to get a hernia recurrence because the tissue got closed. And so that's the upside. The, the downside is oftentimes you have to dissect and take apart, which introduces risk. It creates a space where fluid could fill, yeah. fill up or the risk of infection could occur. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Do you perform mesh removal? And if so, is that something that most plastic surgeons are comfortable with or no? So, um, you know, most of my most complex hernias are done in collaboration with one of my partners. It's a general surgeon, especially if we're going to have to be, you know, doing a bowel resection or going inside the abdomen to do something you know, kind of more on the general surgery side. But, but the answer is absolutely, I think, as part of my practice. I see lots of patients who either have infected mesh or painful mesh or some type of mesh issue. And uh, yeah, I certainly remove a fair amount of mesh. And what's the reason for removal? Is it infection or pain or recurrence or reaction? Yeah, so I think if I had to kind of break it down, I would say, you know, two thirds, it's in the setting of recurrence. And I think the point that you made earlier, I think was such a was such a insightful remark about, you know, trying to remove the minimal amount of natural tissue. And that's kind of my philosophy. If harm is going to be done from removing it that exceeds the benefit of removing it, I won't. Um, but usually the mesh gets removed because of recurrence, and then kind of you know, less frequently is it removed for, you know, a mesh infection or kind of chronic pain. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's less of a problem. So um, in your specialty, you're aware of breast implant illness. You may recall back in the I think, 90s or early 2000s, there was a lot of issues of, you know, maybe silicone is causing a, a autoimmune disorders. So silicone breast implants were taken off the market by the FDA. The company, I forget the name, starts with a D, like went out of business or stopped making it. And then now there's a resurgence of implants, but there is also an understanding of BII, which is called, stands for breast implant illness. Um, in the hernia world, we're a little bit slower to accept, maybe we should call it MII, I don't know, mesh implant illness. Mm -hmm. We call it Asia syndrome or Schoenfeld syndrome, which Asia is an acronym. It stands for autoimmune or autoinflammatory um, syndrome induced by adjuvants. So it includes any type of implant reaction. And it's usually a, a syndrome of systemic symptoms. It could be anything from you know, rashes and random areas and joint pain and swelling and um, so on. So um, what do you know about BII with the breast implant illness or even mesh implants? And like, what are they saying in your specialty about this problem? Because I think it's still not grasped by most practicing surgeons. Well, I think it's a terrific question. I think that our society, the American Society of Plastic Surgery, um, which is, um, you know, our key society, I think is doing a lot of research uh, in this area. Breast implant illness, I think is a real thing. It's a constellation of symptoms a lot of research that's kind of needed to kind of further help us understand both kind of what causes it, kind of what are the kind of key symptoms and kind of what are the best treatment options for, for patients. I think, 
an important kind of um, disease state that's kind of right up against BII is um, something that's really known to be associated with implants and textured implants is called anaplastic large cell lymphoma or ALCL, yes. which has, a, has recently kind of emerged as uh, an associated um, disease state that's related to textured implants, which is very, very specific. That textured surface on these silicone or saline implants causes inflammation over time. Um, and that's something that we're learning a lot about and, and, and treating more and more and, and kind of counseling mm -hmm. our patients on. So um, I think we've learned a lot about that, um, more to go, but, but BII I think is, is a real thing and it's certainly something we have to focus our research efforts on. Yeah, absolutely. And um, do you see a lot of patients in that respect? Uh, we, we do see a lot of patients with breast implant illness. And, you know, I think that, you know, after kind of working patients up for autoimmune issues and, and really understanding kind of their symptomatology, um, the treatment option that we predominantly offer is complete implant removal with removal of the capsule too. So yeah. on, on block capsulectomy and yeah. implant removal, um, send it to pathology. And, and oftentimes patients just have a tremendous relief of symptoms. And it's, it's hard to know if, if, you know, a component of that is the removal of the scar tissue or a component of that is the psychology of it, which I think we have to acknowledge is very important, potentially in impacting the way patients feel after the, the implants removed. So um, yeah, that, that's kind of been my approach. And um, have you ever seen anyone get autonomic dysfunction or like a POTS-like syndrome after the due to uh, implant illness? Or no? I honestly, ha I, I haven't. I haven't either, yeah. But I just spoke to a patient with, with that, so. Oh, we're wow. trying to figure it out. <laughs> I've seen people with POTS, which is a postural ortho uh, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's like you, you drop your blood pressure and constantly have to hydrate. And it's, it's a horrible mm. uh, problem in some patients. People who have POTS, I've seen are more likely to have an implant illness or mesh reactions. I tend not to put mesh in those patients if I know they have POTS, but I've never seen the reverse where the implant illness creates like a pot, POTS-like syndrome. I guess it can. Um, hmm. Do you treat patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? Treated a few, yeah. Very uh, unique population with the genetic uh, collagenopathy. Um, that's basically a fancy term for they have kind of a, a genetic or a gene-based issue with how their collagen works and functions. Um, very tricky patients to fix a hernia and definitely seen some some patients, because we have a big, um, you know, Ehlers Danlos Center at Penn. Um, I typically, when fixing those patients, I will use permanent mesh in those in those folks. That's kind of yeah. definitely a, a subgroup of patients that I would put permanent mesh in to support them because of their kind of known kind of healing issues. Um, so one of my tricks is for groin hernias. They often come in with pelvic floor dysfunction and they have like a a groin pain. Um, and they have either a hernia or a direct hernia or, or laxity or some combination of those. So instead of treating them like a regular angle hernia pair where we patch the hole, I do like a, like a tummy tuck of their groin. I do application of their groin first, and then I put the tissue repair, I put the mesh repair because um, they need that extra tightness to get rid of their symptoms. Um, it works really, really well. It's like my trick on how to deal That's with, awesome. with Ehlers Danlos. I assume. Uh, do you all? Oh, do you have any tricks too for how you handle this? Well, so, so um, uh, you know, not not really. Um, for the abdominal wall, I typically apply kind of my standard technique, which is get the tissue closed. Um, usually, if they need a release, they'll get a release, and I just put in permanent prosthetic mesh, and typically do kind of a wider mesh overlap. So usually, that would kind of mean I would be doing a a tar, as you mentioned, or a transversus release, or kind of oh, releasing wow. the, the the backside of the abdominal wall uh, and put in a big piece of kind of prosthetic mesh. Yeah, I feel like these patients are so loosey goosey and uh, stretchy that you have to tighten them much more mm -hmm. than you would a normal patient. A normal patient would not tolerate that much tightness, but they would. They would. So I have a um, personal patient question. So I have a patient with Ehlers Danlos and mesh reaction. So we've tried everything. Every time she had mesh in her, she had a horrible reaction, rashes, itching, um, joint pains, a lot of other symptoms. Uh, you take the mesh out, she does great. Uh, but then her hernia comes back. <laughs> so, mm. um, so now she has incisional hernia, ingle hernias, 
my thought was to just do like a huge plication of everything, tighten her all up as a tissue repair. The hernias are not so big that she needs any component separation, but like almost like a plication of everything. And me, but, but I don't feel comfortable doing that in a patient with Ehlers Danlos without putting some type of mesh in her, but she's reacted to every mesh. So maybe it would have to be a biologic mesh, even though I've had patients react to biologic mesh too. So do you have any, <laughs> can you help it's me? It's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting situation and obviously kind know. of a, a, comp, a, a complex clinical situation. I, I like your idea. I think that, um, you know, when I think about hernia as a disease, I think that, you know, the, the most important thing, kind of the, the determining factor, I think is getting that tissue closed. And so I think that if you can get that tissue closed and, and get an attention free state, I, I think you're going to really get the most bang for your buck in terms of what's going to be most impactful in terms of the outcome you want. So um, I would say, you know, that might be the, the way to go is get a kind of attention free plication and kind of see how the patient does because not everyone needs mesh. I think, um, I think, you know, we've gotten so accustomed to um, you know, putting mesh in, in everyone because we've got great data that supports it. But, um, you know, many people that get mesh maybe don't need it um, is, is, you know, we just don't know. I mean, that, that's just me being totally honest is that, you know, we do things because we have data, but maybe some people get mesh that don't need it. Um, you know, maybe some people that don't get mesh need it. It's kind of still kind of a, an area where we need kind of more, I think, knowledge. Yeah. So she's failed tissue repairs, but I wonder you know, for at least for the incisional part, I wonder if a tissue repair with application on top, using her own tissue as her biologic mesh would work. Would you feel comfortable doing that in an ehlers danlos patient? I mean, I think it's worth a try. I think, again, it's, it's you know, kind of you know, going to be a function of kind of your relationship with the patient, kind of talking yeah. them through. And it sounds like you have a wonderful relationship with this patient and you could, yeah. you could talk with him him. or her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, that does, it makes sense to me. I think it's reasonable. You know, she's been through so much. Okay, we'll eventually fix her and then we'll have to celebrate. Um, yeah. Okay, going back to component separation, are there, so is the rate of surgical infection higher or the same than other hernias with component separation? And then do they need like more complicated surgery for that or? treatments for that than regular? That's a question being asked. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I kind of alluded to this before, Shireen. I think that it's, it really relates to kind of the, the necessity of doing the component separation, I think basically signifies or it means that, you know, the patient has some type of complicated, you know, hernia. And so I think those, those individual patients are going to be higher risk for having complications. The act of doing the component separation, when you kind of break it down, involves releasing more tissue, taking things apart. So there's some intrinsic risk to that. And so I think that the short answer to the question is that yes, it probably does increase the risk of wound complications. To my knowledge, I don't know that it actually increases the risk of an infection or what's called the surgical site infection or SSI, but I think it does increase the risk of having events or issues with healing or fluid. Yeah. Um, does that require more surgery? Not often, at least in my hands. Um, and I think that the data and the literature um, really doesn't have a clear answer because there's not a trial where you compare, you know, complex hernias where you did or didn't do it, at least to, to my knowledge, because I think it's kind of become our standard. Um, there's not a randomized trial looking at, you know, do we do a release or do we don't do a release if the patient yeah. might need it? So we kind of don't have the answer. I have a question about belly buttons. Um, sure. often I see patients that are told, oh, we can fix you, but then your belly button's going to be gone. And I'm a big mm. advocate of saving the belly button and that everyone should deserve to have any. So <laughs> it's like my thing. Um, but what are the situations in which you lose the belly button? Even like in your specialty, I'm sure you, you probably spend more time trying to save a belly button than the average general surgeon, because you know, that like you're an aesthetic, aesthetically inclined. So uh, like, for example, the lady that we presented, the 16th centimeter diastasis recti, is she going to lose her belly button? 100%. Oh, really? Yeah. But, 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 Tell but what why. I, so, so, well, so, so it's a great question. Why? Um, and I, I think that in order to 
you know, reestablish the integrity of the abdominal wall. It's basically fancy plastic surgeon talk for get her tissue back together so she has normal function. You're going to have to release tissue. She probably has, I mean, this patient, I have to imagine, does not have an, any, I mean, with that much diastasis, there's, there's probably total disruption of the, the kind of the, the features of the belly button. So for someone like this, if, if, if she came to my office, she would most likely get um, a full abdominoplasty with a mesh base repair of the diastasis. And I would do what's called a neo umbilicoplasty. I would create yes. a new belly button. Okay. The old one is just not going to be suitable. Uh, um, I often tell these patients that, um, you know, when you, when you have to tighten the muscles that much, you're kind of creating these competing forces. When you think about it, sure, you, you tighten this much, the belly button gets kind of pulled in. Yes. And then you got to pull it back through the skin. So you create right. all these adverse factors affecting the blood supply to the belly button. And I said, I typically say, is it's going to either have a healing issue or get infected? And so we typically just make a new one, which um, I think it's not perfect, but I think that it still kind of recreates what you want to see. Yeah, I've seen those. They look okay. If done correctly. <laughs> <laughs> There's all these different tricks. But, yes. Okay. So is that because a belly button's kind of floating or is because when you do the plication, you the the center of that plication will be so deep that you don't really have a stock to give you much of a belly button. Well, so there's a, there's a couple of reasons. You, you can definitely, if you're doing a vertical cut for this individual who has the big diastasis, you could leave the belly button attached to one side of the skin. The issue would then become after you raise the skin up and you tighten this, or, or maybe you're doing this robotically. I'm not sure. All, all I can tell you is that if you, if you placated, you're going to have so much loose skin in the midline yeah. that it's just not going to look right. You're going you're gonna to probably want to have to excise that. Yeah. And do you recommend, let's say that, let's say that uh, it's a patient with a large incisional hernia and some loose skin. Um, do you recommend a two-stage operation? Like let's get a good hernia repair done. And then in a second stage, see how you heal and then come back and we'll take off all the extra skin or do you do them both at the same time? I typically, we typically do them at the same time. And I think there's a couple of reasons, you know, usually, you know, for, for most of my patients who have hernia, a lot of this is through their insurance company. And so we typically kind of bundle them together and, and rather than doing two different operations, insurance will oftentimes let us do them both at the same time. And then for the patient's convenience, we typically do them at the same time. It does introduce a little bit of risk though, because yeah. it's two, it's two operations at once. And so we tell patients there's a higher risk of having a wound healing issue, basically because of the cut that we're going to make where we're taking the skin off, there's just more healing to do. And so we kind of tell patients that, but I really haven't, at least to my knowledge, met a patient who has regretted doing, if I recommended it, the skin removal with the hernia repair. People, sure. I think, uniformly are very satisfied. Yeah, sure. No, I get it. I just, uh, I, I've i liked to do that because I think that seems to be the right thing. The literature, like you said, does show that there's a higher risk of complications, wound complications in doing so. And I hate wound complications. <laughs> Well, that makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question, how, going back to mesh reactions, are, are, immune, are immune suppressants ever considered for patients like that, for those who have reactions to mesh? You know, the very first paper that I remember reading was maybe 20 years ago or 25 years ago about someone who may have had a mesh reaction, and they gave the patient cyclosporin which is a hmm. very old school, very strong immune suppressant with so many risks to it. Um, so, and I've seen other patients be on Humira uh, and having good response to Humira for the immune um, res like response against the mesh, but that's so much, like just take out the mesh usually. So much yeah, other complications, right? What do you think? I would. I would I would tend to agree with you on that. I think that, you know, the, the benefits of being on immunosuppression, I, I don't know if they're there for, for, for kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. So one question I get a lot is, you know, uh, so how do I know that my plastic surgeon is going to do a good job? You know, they're great in doing boobs and BBLs and maybe a nose job, but you know, in Beverly Hills, theoretically, all the plastic surgeons here can do abdominal wall reconstruction. 
um, they don't. In fact, there is a handful where they ask me to do the umbilical hernia as part of the tummy tuck. Like they don't even want responsibility for the umbilical hernia part. Um, and I do most of the abdominal wall hernia reconstruction in our hospital. It's not done by our plastic surgeons. And part of it is they're just busy doing other things. And so when our fellows go and interview, <laughs> I remember one of our fellows went and interviewed and he said, oh, so you do like abdominal wall reconstruction? He's like, yeah, and who does it? And it's like, Dr. Tofa, like, she's not a plastic surgeon. Why are your plastic surgeons doing it? So it's a little bit of a turf battle, but how does a patient know if they should be choosing a plastic surgeon or a general surgeon for their pretty pair? How do they, how could they tell if it's the right surgeon to, to seek consultation with? What are your recommendations? Great, great question. I think that 90, I hate to say it to all my plastic surgery friends listening. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, it's um, unusual that a plastic surgeon would be focused on or do a lot of hernia or complex hernia. I yeah. think that I'm one of a few people that as part of their practice does, you know, both regular hernia and complex hernia. It's a plastic surgeon. That's just kind of one aspect of my reconstructive and aesthetic practice. But I think for, for the most part, you know, hernias are, are fixed by general surgeons and fixed yeah. quite well. Um, I think that, you know, as we touched upon some of the benefits of having a plastic surgeon involved, I, I think that, you know, we, we kind of bring that aesthetic orientation to the fold. Um, but I think your, your point's a great point. The one that you just mentioned, Sharon, is that, you know, you come in and fix the belly button hernias for some of your plastic surgeons. There's such great opportunity for collaboration, um, yeah. you know, kind of across disciplines, because we, we bring different skill sets and backgrounds and kind of what's better than having people with different backgrounds collaborate. I, th I think it oh, works I great. Love it. I love it. I work with all different sur surgeons. I love going to the plastic surgeons. Can, and I actually, so I don't just pop in, do the belly button and leave. I stay for the entire operation because oh, I, love, I it. Oh, that's great. love learning. And, and let me tell you, one of my favorite plastic surgeons I trained when he was a general surgery resident. So he was my resident. He was a great resident. And I think he's so good that I refer a lot of my patients to him. And so we operate together. He is so like obsessive compulsive <laughs> that he won't let me put any sutures in. You know, like usually if you're sharing a case, I'll do one side, you do the other side at the end or yeah. something like that. No, I'm allowed to cut suture. It. That's it. So, oh, wow. <laughs> And gotta, I was, I was his attending. remind him who trained him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, exactly. I was the one who was his professor at one time. But, oh, that's uh, funny. you know, that's just a sign of a plastic surgeon that's really kind of loves what they do and really good at what they do. And, uh, <laughs> but I love the collaboration. I stay for the entire, op they keep telling me, you can leave now. Nope. I love to stay for the whole thing and watch and see what you guys do. And I see some amazing stuff that you all do the new belly button, um, different ways of making the belly button look good for a tummy tuck. Uh, Definitely. This whole idea of not using mesh if you're going to do a tummy tuck anyway. Um, and then the breast stuff is really cool. You know, making the, the nipples smaller and breast mm -hmm. lifts and all that. Very cool stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I work a lot with urology and gynecology too. And so, I didn't used to understand a lot of what they did before, but you know, you kind of learn and it helps you when you talk with your patients. Oh, well, this is what they're gonna do or most likely this, or if they come to you and they say, yeah, I went to my plastic surgeon, they said X, Y, and Z. I'm like, okay, that does not sound right. Get a second opinion. Yeah. Cause it, it's, it's, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool that you're getting able to, you know, you're able to see what other specialists are doing. Cause you know, oftentimes we're, we're driving so fast in our own little lane and we don't get a chance to kind of look okay. around and kind of see what's happening with our colleagues around us. So I think that that's such a useful thing to do. And I, I think it can bring, bring some things into your practice that you can, you can use uh, to help your patients. I think it's, that's terrific. Absolutely. I so agree with that. And, you know, um, as, an, as a practicing surgeon, you often, look, as a resident, you operate with, you know, 50 different attendings. You learn 50 different ways of doing the same thing and you pick and choose what you like for your own practice eventually. And that's really a great way to learn. When you're in your own practice, once you're graduated, it's not common to be in someone else's operating room, you know? So I do enjoy the collaboration with other surgeons. And I also, when I'm like in between cases, 
I kind of peek into other people's rooms, mostly for social visits. Like our, I say our OR is like a country club. <laughs> <laughs> I go from room to room, hey guys, what you doing? Oh, what are you doing there? Hey. Oh, look at that. <laughs> or, or whatever the situation is. But I also like to see what other people do because you lose that interaction. That's great. You're, you're like, you're like the bee, you're like the bee buzzing around cross pollinating all the flowers. Yeah. No, that's great. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Although if they're doing hernias, sometimes I don't go in the room because I feel like they think yeah. I'm peeking in there, or critiquing or something. So I, I, I try to be respectful. I don't do that too much. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> okay. We have more questions. Um, it's an honor and privilege to hear two great knowledgeable professors during this S webinar. Thank you so much. Okay, how yeah, do you thank you. Yeah, that's very nice. How do you decide whether to use monofilament or braided suture? One softer, one has less infection risk. These are amazing. Yeah, that's, that's a, yeah that's, <laughs> that's a really insightful question. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I you know, so braided suture is great because it, it handles really well. But the two braided sutures that I'm familiar with that I use are, are Vicryl, which will oftentimes close the soft tissue with or you know, the skin and fat layers, that's kind of a, a suture that's braided that kind of goes away pretty quickly. For the most part, um, I use monofilament suture, you know, as you mentioned, Shirin, um, you know, slow absorbing monofilament suture is kind yeah. of what we use for fascia closure. That's basically um, a suture that slowly goes away over time as your body gets stronger. It's kind of how I explain it to patients. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what, what I use for the most part for closing these hernia defects. Yeah, I agree. Um, I feel that the more, the closer you are to the skin, the more likely I am to use the braided sutures so that they don't see, mm -hmm. they don't feel the knot or the stiff end. Um, but I do prefer the monofilament for the reasons explained. Um, this question, I don't understand too much. It says, for component separation, do you need to dissect the intimate fascia under the anterior rectus sheath? And how does that compromise abdominal wall function? Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, but maybe yeah, you either. can explain how it compromises abdominal wall function when you start releasing different components. Yeah, so I think that this is kind of emerging maybe as a theme is that, um, yeah. you know, is that you, you have to do a very precise release. And I think that, um, you know, in going to a surgeon, if you have a complex hernia, you really have to make sure he or she um, has the background and skill set to be able to, you know, kind of do an advanced or, or complicated repair. And so when, when you do the release, you, you have to avoid where what we call the neurovascular bundles are. That's basically a fancy word for the blood, the blood vessels and, and, and kind of nerves. And if you, if you disrupt or injure any of those kind of sensory or motor nerves to the rectus muscle as mm -hmm. you're doing the release, so you're in the wrong layer, and you're in the layer where the nerves are, you could potentially compromise the innervation or the, the kind of the signaling to the muscle of the rectus complex, which could lead to weakness or even kind of a bulge or a change in the way the abdominal wall looks. Yeah. And we've seen examples, um, you know, at our meeting um, of, of, of patients who have ultimately had complications from component separation. So it's a known risk, but um, I think going to someone who's got, you know, uh, good technique and good skill set, I think is probably your best bet. Yeah, I totally agree with that. We've seen some botched component separations and redoing those are really difficult, especially if there's nerve damage. There's very little to do with um, denervated muscle. There's, you can't reverse it. Actually, let me ask you this. Can you reverse it? Because there is some like nerve transfers that are done in, by plastic surgeons. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, so as an example, like if you injure your arm and you sever your nerve, there's so many different, you know, nerve techniques that you can use. You can, um, you can repair the nerve, you can, you know, sew a new nerve to it to kind of stimulate it. The issue with the abdominal wall is it's not one nerve, it's so many small nerves. And so yeah. when you disrupt multiple nerves, it would, it would be a, a significant task to kind of co apt or, or kind of bring back together all those small disrupted nerves. Now, I think to my knowledge, it, it hasn't been done or hasn't been done successfully. And there's also kind of a critical window where you know, the muscle, when it loses its nerve supply, undergoes these kind of structural changes where it's no longer gonna work after a period of time. And oftentimes yeah. there's a big separation between the inciting event and then kind of when you see the patient. And so right. it'd be very difficult to, to do that. 
And it kind of brings me to this other point is that what you've been talking about is that you go from a hernia problem to a dysfunction of the abdominal wall, which is almost like an unfixable problem. Now you might be able to get it so they don't have a big bulging deformed abdominal wall, but there's gonna be a fundamental loss of function because yeah. of what's happened. And so that's gotta be a conversation you have with your patients. Yeah, I agree. All right, this last question is intense and I think it's the most appropriate question to end on. Where do you think the future of abdominal wall reconstruction is going? Is it more robotics, more minimally invasive or engineering of different mesh materials? Ooh, so this is like a multiple choice type question. That well, the big one what are your thoughts? <laughs> I, well, so I think that I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. This is going to be kind of a cliche answer, um, but I, I will tell you um, of those choices that I think about. But let me just answer kind of what I really kind of believe in my heart of hearts is the yeah. right answer is, is, is us understanding kind of what works best for each patient kind of in which circumstance. I think, you know, learning over time kind of what approach is going to kind of get the best result for the patient. And that is such a broad statement that I mean to say is that will some patients be better served with a minimally invasive repair? Do some patients need application only and no mesh? Um, do some patients really fundamentally benefit from having the skin removed? I think we're not kind of really yet there with our evidence to understand kind of this is the set of operations each patient should kind of be offered. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, robotics, I think is here to stay. I think minimally invasive surgery is, is really super um, important to the field. Um, and this is coming from a plastic surgeon who does yeah. basically everything open. And I, I think that, um, you know, technology has had a huge impact on the field. So I think we have to acknowledge the impact of robotics and minimally invasive surgery. Um, it makes the recovery better. I think it can reduce pain. So many great things. Um, you know, the future of kind of, you know, customized meshes could be a big deal, kind of, yeah. you know, you know, tailoring the mesh for the individual patient and kind of really making printing. it kind of customized. Exactly. Making the mesh for, for the patient. But I, I really do believe, I think that the, the biggest thing for the field is going to gonna be to continue to, to get evidence or information that helps us kind of make better decisions. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, we're, we're doing more better for patients. I don't know. I think, so. I think so too. I, I think, you know, do, doing better for each of our patients in, in any way we can. And, and I, I think that I'm always humbled by like talking with other surgeons and kind of seeing other people's approaches because what, what I realize is there's so many different ways to get great results. And that's kind of a thing that I say when I talk to folks is that, you know, there's not one way to do it. There's not necessarily a right or wrong way. I, I think okay. there's just a lot of, a lot of good ways to get good results. And what's fun is hearing other people's perspectives. So true. Well, I really enjoyed this hour. Thank you you for donating your time to this we learned so much we had tons of questions coming through thank you for your time this ends hernia talk live this tuesday i'll make sure that i post the link to the youtube so you can watch it again share it with with uh, whoever you'd like to share it with thanks for those of you that joined us on zoom and on uh, facebook at dr tofi follow me on hernia doc at hernia doc on twitter and instagram and again thanks dr fisher it was great Thank you so much. I appreciate Take care. It. Okay. See you later or see you soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Yep.